How many of you, as Brian told the kids, like to laugh? Right? We have memories, right? You have memories that when you think of them, you laugh. Right? There's things that from your past that you have stored away someplace that when you think of that, you laugh. One of mine is, from my younger days, I was probably 17. Um, I was out one night in my 76 Silverado pickup truck with two of my friends, John and Tom. I still have it. And we were driving and we were getting John home. It was 9.58. John had to be home at 10. We were four minutes from his house. <laughs> we're driving down this curvy road by our high school. And it was September, October. It was after the harvest. The fields were empty, right? They hadn't quite been cleaned up yet, though. So they hadn't been plowed over yet. Cornfields. So this one curvy road, I took the straight line across. <laughs> I went right across that and picked up the road on the other side. I dropped John off. We got him home just in time. And the next morning he came to me and he said, I'm glad there was a lef- enough light that I could see the corn stalks in the driveway, that I could get them out so mom wouldn't ask me how the corn stalks had gotten in. Right? It's a, it's a memory that makes you laugh. I'll explain it later. Mom and dad will explain it later. It's okay. We have memories that make us laugh, like that one. You're all going to remember that for years to come. Next year on Transfiguration Sunday, I'm going to remind you of that. Remember when I told that story? And I don't get it. I don't get it. And then we have memories that aren't quite so fuzzy and warm. And make us, they don't make us laugh. They make us get somber. And think about things that aren't quite so good. Um, I have a very vivid remembrance of a week um, on Lake Erie from 2008, where for all, intents, for all intents and purposes, my wife and I should be dead because of this week. Um, it was a very intense storm that happened um, at, during this week at camp, and we actually were crawling through trees, 150-year-old trees, down across the road um, in probably about two foot of water. And thankfully, when those trees came down and they pulled down the power lines that were still in that two foot of water, that it blew the transformer at the end of the street. Because otherwise, when we hit that water, we would have been fried. That's not a memory that brings back warm and fuzzy memories, really. (laughs) But I can still see those trees and feel the limbs and feel the water coming down on top of me like it was yesterday. Right? We have memories of things. We have memories of things that sometimes we want to forget and we can't. One of those memories for me is when I was 17, about the same time that I had to get John home. Um, My father passed away on Easter morning. And the one memory that I remember from that instance is the person coming up to me thinking they were being helpful, said, God needed him, that's why he took him at Easter, or God takes his best people at Easter. That might be a warm, fuzzy statement to say to somebody, but it's really not. It's not a helpful thing to say to somebody at that point in time. When they're grieving the loss of somebody that God needs them more than I did, that's a bunch of horse hockey. That doesn't help at all. How is that supposed to help me? But that's how we react to the things, right? When we don't understand what's going on around us or we don't understand the circumstances of life that seem to impact us and hit us at a point in time, we try to put them and to pinhole them into situations and into places so that we can make sense of it, so that we can have it ordered in our plan, so that we can have it under control and set forth the way that it's supposed to happen in our lives. And then we get a reading like today, the Transfiguration. Today is the last Sunday of the season of Epiphany. My daughter asked me earlier what season of the church is. So she should know that. It's the season of Epiphany. The last Sunday of the season of Epiphany is the Transfiguration, where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and they go up the mountain. 
And before their eyes, Jesus is transfigured. He is transformed. He is changed into something white. I find it uh, very odd that today most of the churches on the east coast of the United States are canceled because of a white out. God has a sense of humor. (laughs) Jesus was transfigured. He was transformed. He was turned dazzling white. And Mark himself, the author of our gospel, even fumbled over this. He says it was whiter than anything that could be made white on earth. It's like, it's not enough to say that Jesus was changed into white. It's that Jesus was changed into a white that you can't possibly understand. Right? We can't understand it. And Jesus was transfigured, and Peter standing in front of him, I can almost imagine it. Peter, and I can imagine me being Peter, right? Standing there going, how about we build three tents? We'll just put them up and we'll just stay up here for a while, right? And the tent seems to be, for us, out of the ordinary, out of the blue, but it's really not because this all plays into the festival of booths, which is the festival of tents, which is a huge Jewish festival, which was six days from the time of the things that just happened. That's why it says at the beginning of our reading, six days later, it is a complete connection to the festival of booths, which we don't see and we don't understand. But Peter says, let's build three tents and put them up here so that we can remember this and we can stay here for a while. He's trying to make a memory. He's trying to place things into order so that he can understand them, to make them fit into a system that Peter wants them to fit into. Right? Peter wants it to make sense to him. But here's the thing. What happens after Peter says that? Peter says, let's put up three tents. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you, Jesus. God breaks in. The cloud opens up, and the voice thunders from above, saying, Peter, don't worry about it. Just listen to this man. Because he knows what's going on. Okay, that's not exactly what God said. But that's what God said. Right? This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Peter almost missed it. He almost missed what was happening because he was so worried about making this things fit into his set form, his set pattern, his set plan for the way things were going to happen. And because he couldn't wrap his mind around the chaos of the situation, around the unknowing of what was happening up there on the mountain when Jesus turned wider than than anything that we could possibly imagine on earth, he couldn't grasp it, so he had to try to make a memory of it. Here's the thing. We talk about God's plan for us, and God has this plan, and God has this life set out in front of us. What if there is no plan? What if God loves us so much that no matter what happens, that He's always going to be with us? That even in the chaos of standing there with Jesus on the mountaintop where He meets Moses and Elijah, and they're talking about all the things that have happened and all the things that are yet to come, and we don't get it. And we try then to push it into our plan and our, our form. It's just God trying to tell us that no matter what happens in this world, I'm always going to be there with you. And I'm always going to be the one that's going to make sure that I'm walking with you and giving you the strength to make it through whatever it is that is going to happen and whatever is going to come. What is that the case? That God loves us so much that it doesn't matter what's going to happen, that he's always going to be with us. Now, does that mean that God doesn't know what's going to happen? I don't know. I honestly don't know if God has a complete plan set out for everything that's going to happen in our life. Because of our own free will and our own choices to make those decisions, things flux and things change. The thing that I can guarantee to you without a shadow of a doubt is that no matter what happens in your life, good or bad, corn stalks in a driveway or crawling through trees, that God is always there with you. And that's what should be important. Not that we completely understand the situation or what's happening in that moment in time, but we understand the fact that God loves us so much that He's never going to leave us, that He's never going to forsake us. And that is really the only memory that you ever have to have. The memory that God loved you so much, that He died for you on a cross, 
that he became wider than white, and he shines in the darkness so that it can't even overcome it, that even the slightest bit of darkness is going to be chased away because Jesus loves us so much. And that's what we need to remember. That's what we need to move into the world with because Christ goes with us every moment of every day, and he loves you more than you could possibly imagine. So hold on to those memories and laugh a little. And remember that Jesus loves you and that he always walks with you, no matter what happens. Whether you understand it or not, Jesus is always there, giving you strength and hope. So let's go out there and tell everyone that they too can have that strength and that hope because Christ loves them just as he loves us.